Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be learning about electronic systems. So we're going to recall some electronic components that we should know from previous years and from science classes. Consider how electronics functions as a system. Learn about some input, process and output devices and how they're used in the real world. So this is the PCB that we use in the year nine project, which is for an MP3 speaker, so like a phone speaker. So we thought this would be a good place to start so that you can get some familiar with some. So this is the PCB or printed circuit board. It's obviously a, a plastic uh, based board. And as you can see in the bottom here, um, we have the copper tracks. Now this is embedded between, sandwiched between the layers of plastic and that allows the electricity to move around between the components. We also have the auxiliary cable or three and a half mil jack and the speaker. And here we have some of the key components that we're going to uh, be looking at. So these are resistors, the little peanut shaped ones with little colored bands on them to, to, to uh, tell you what resistance they are. We have electrolytic and disc capacitors. And if you can't see from the top, that's what they look like from the side. And this little one down here, which often gets overlooked. This is the, we call it, uh, you know, it's nicknamed a microchip. Um, but we're going to talk about that one in a little bit more detail in a minute. Of course, we all know that uh, in an electronic diagram, we don't draw pictures, right? So we use symbols instead. So let's have a look at some of the symbols. Well, this one's for the resistor. This one's an electrolytic or just a capacitor. And then this is a speaker. So if we look around in our electronic diagram, then we can see here are the resistors. And there's another one over here and they're all labeled R. We have our speaker over here. It's a little bit different, but, uh, but that's the same thing. And then we have a variety of capacitors all dotted around the, um, the diagram. And then we have our auxiliary cable or our, our input on one side. And uh, here's our quote microchip. Now this is the very complex looking thing. And these represent, these numbers represent the legs that are on the little uh, chip. We do think of electronics as a system. So they can be really complicated, but we can obviously break it down into three simple blocks. And we learned about this in mechanisms as well, if you want to go back and review that one. So we have input, process and output blocks. So in mechanisms, we looked at uh, this example of a system diagram. So the input was the force applied by the, uh, to the pedal by the, by the rider's feet. The process is the chain and gear system converting energy into the rear wheel and propelling the bike forward. Okay, so there's our input process output. So electronic systems work in a very similar way. So our input devices or components receive an external signal which triggers the system to work. Then we have process devices or components which make the decision in that electronic system. And then output devices respond to that decision made by the processors and usually have some kind of visual or auditory output like a buzzer or a light. So a quick overview just to get us thinking, get us started. Let's look at a kettle, say. Well, what's the input going to be? Well, we I picked this because it should be really easy. Most of us make a cup of tea in the morning. What do we do? Well, we obviously after we filled it with water, we press the button, right? That's the input. The process is going to be the little um, uh, chip that's going on inside and the various components all uh, making decisions about what's going on. And then the output um, is going to be, first of all, you might have a light in your kettle, right? And then everything will turn off. That's the output once it's reached the required temperature. How about uh, an automatic night light like you might have on your landing? Well, the input is going to be the lack of light, right? It gets dark enough and then uh, that will trigger the, uh, the little sensor in there. The process devices, it's going to be a series of components uh, and then the output is that the light turns on. And then how about uh, a little timer like you might set for uh, if you're cooking something at dinner? Well, the input is going to be whatever buttons you're setting, right? And obviously the start button to make it go. The process devices is going to be quite a complicated series of uh, chips and systems going on inside and components. 
and then the output is going to be the alarm, wap, 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 telling you, of course, that your food is ready. If we bring that idea back to our, um, our speaker device, well, what's our input? Well, in this case, it's going to be that auxiliary jack from the phone, or moreover, it's that music information, isn't it? Because that data is coming in from the phone. What's going to be the process? Well, we've got various components. We've got our resistors and our capacitors and our little chip working together to do things like smooth out that signal to reduce the, uh, or sorry, amplify rather, uh, the sound. And then our output, of course, is going to be our, from our speaker, which is converting that data from uh, that information that's going around back into sound that we can hear. So now we've got a little bit of a better understanding, let's look deeper at some inputs. So of course, input devices receive an external signal triggering a system to work. So variable resistors, which these typically are, change the resistance in the circuit. So as in sort of pushing back, right? Often due to an external factor like temperature. So this alters the electrical current in the wires, which is then passed on to the processing components that will dictate what they're going to do. So we have our, our kettle and our nightlight back again. We also have things like a thermometer and uh, this one down here, which is uh, detecting um, the fuel quantity in our car. I'm going to come back to these very soon. So our first one is a light dependent resistor. Hopefully you might be familiar with this from one of your previous uh, projects in uh, year seven, eight or nine. And these detect changes in light levels. So this is what our electronic symbol looks like. And it makes a lot of sense, really, because a resistor is just the rectangle. But the arrows coming in are, is indicating that it's taking in light, right? And then here's our the actual component itself. That's what it looks like. So an example is an automatic nightlight, just like we saw on our landing, but also ones that you find outside in your garden and also uh, lamps on uh, streetlights. Also, maybe your toilet. Um, <laughs> there's some pretty cool ones um, to uh, make sure that uh, you're not going to trip and fall. Next up, we have thermistors. Of course, that sounds very familiar, like thermometer, right? So thermo meaning temperature. So they detect changes in temperature. So this is our uh, symbol. And again, we have the basis of our resistor because it's a variable resistor. And then the line going through it indicating temperature, like a rise in temperature. And this is what the components typically look like, although they vary quite a lot. So an example is a thermometer like you'd put in your mouth. Also a meat thermometer, right, that you might use in food technology. Kettles, as we talked about. OK, but also things like central heating systems and car engines as well. Anything where if the temperature gets too high, you need some kind of output. You need to actually indicate uh, that there's a problem occurring. Okay. The last one is a pressure sensor. So when we say pressure, we're talking about um, air or fluid pressure. OK, so they're detecting perhaps a drop in an air or fluid pressure, which might indicate that either you're out of the recommended amount of fluid that you need, or there might be a leak, there might be a problem. So this is what the components typically look like. And the examples we have, first of all, is a car fuel sensor. So that little light doesn't come on, or you might not get a, get a bing, like I have in my car, it comes on, um, until the pressure fluid sensor um, in the tank says, oh, you've gone too low, the pressure's reduced, so actually you need to go and refuel. You also might have one in things like a hydraulic pressure sensor. OK, so for here for our JCB digger, um, the hydraulic systems are here. And this actually uh, controls, it's, it's a, um, a water-based or oil-based um, hydraulic pressure. And that uh, actually moves the arm. So let's say that the JCB uh, operator uh, had a little indicator light that actually the pressure was too low and then he might have start to have issues with the digger. So let's get on to processors. So uh, these are process devices which make the decisions in an electronic system. The first, uh, so processing components process the input information and make decisions to determine the output. These are typically tiny unremarkable chips found alongside other components just like the one we had for our speaker. But they are incredibly complex. They're amazing. 
So the first we're going to look at are integrated circuits. So we don't call them microchips. They're called integrated circuits or ICs. Okay. So these are tiny self-contained circuits, right? But they have millions of components inside. So they're a circuit within a circuit. They're astonishing. If you actually open one up, you can see, you can just about see here, see all the tiny little lines in there. Those are just like the copper tracks on our larger circuit. And if I open up another one, there we go. You can see all these little fine wires coming into this incredibly complicated circuit. And if we zoom in, that's what it looks like. So these are the silicon chips that actually dictate what's going on. So the benefits are that they are cheaper than the separate components, right? So if you have multiple components, it's going to get quite expensive. And of course, they are tiny, super, super small, which is great for portable devices like your mobile phone. Uh, and they're also very energy efficient. Now, we also have microcontrollers. These are a special type of uh, IEC. So they are essentially a computer within a computer. And they have their own inputs, processors, memory, and outputs. They get even more complicated. They're amazing. And this is the kind of ones that we tend to see on uh, circuit boards, right? Complicated circuit boards like in your computer. So they're found in essentially all electronic products. Everything really basic like your microwave or your washing machine, your dishwasher. And the benefits is that they do the job of multiple integrated circuits, multiple ICs, and they are programmable because you want to have, uh, you know, your microwave move around at a certain speed or pace and power. Um, but the issue is that they are more expensive, right, than, uh, than other integrated circuits, which makes sense. Now, you can also have microcontroller boards. These are uh, combined with other components and they're programmable. So one things like the BBC Microbit, Raspberry Pi and Arduino. You may have even had a little play with some of these before. Now, the micro bit, just to give you a few examples, of course, they are programmable. And the point of this is that it's supposed to be accessible for, uh, for, ch for children and young people. So you can do it on the computer. And then they have a little light up panel. But some people have done all sorts of stuff with them. You can see they made some little friends and a little smiley face here. They've done things like uh, indicate whether, uh, like if they scored a goal, maybe the uh, the numbers, and even done things like play music, amazing. Microcontrollers can be used as timers and as counters. These clever circuits generate and count pulses of charge, okay, which is really useful in lots of everyday products. So we've come back to our microwaves and our washing machines, okay, you wanna set the time for the task. Also for things like car indicator lights, to uh, indicate the interval with which they should flash. And also things like car rev counters, right? So the revolutions per minute, it's counting those and then it's uh, feeding back information visually to that output, to that dashboard. Used as decision makers. So logic gates make decisions based on a collection of digital inputs. If it's on, that's a one, okay, in digital data, or if it's off, that's a zero, ones and zeros. So there's three types of logic gates. They're called AND, OR, and NOT gates. So to create the expected output in each of these, for an AND gate, you need to have one input must be on and another input must be on. So an example is our washing machine. So the door must be locked and you have to press the start button. In an OR gate, one input OR another can be on. So for instance, like a, uh, a self-closing door. You have sensors on both sides of the door. So you can have one door sensor being activated by somebody or the other on the other side of the door. And then a not gate, so the input must not be on, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but for instance, things like power emergency push buttons, right? So if you push the emergency button, the power will turn off. Okay, so it's not what you'd expect. We have outputs. The output depends on what your product has to do. It usually involves visual or sound, things like lamps, LEDs, flashing, buzzers, right? And also things like LCD displays. In summary, PCBs consist of copper tracks and components. We can have block diagrams of inputs, processors, and outputs. Things like variable resistors, LDRs, thermistors, pressure sensors, processors, uh, integrated circuits, also microprocessors. Uh, can be used as timers and counters and decision makers, and then things like outputs like LEDs and buzzers.
Well done, guys. Catch you in class. See you later.